Good morning. My name is Joshua Mifflin. I'm the family ministries pastor here at Park Place Church of God. And I can't tell you how thankful I am that you are all here. Just let that sit in just for a second. Let that sink in. You're here. You are here. I love the fact that right now, you all are intentionally here together in the presence of our Savior. Whether you're here in this building, physically speaking, or you're tuning in at home, you're here. And I'm so thankful for that. It's a reminder that we are truly the body of Christ, no matter where we're at. We are the church. And yes, these are unprecedented times and I never in my wildest dreams would have imagined that we'd be going through a global pandemic like this. Trust me, there was no seminary class at AU School of Theology that was intro to global pandemics. But we're here together. I do want to bring your attention to a few things. Uh, Your worship guide can be found by going to our website, ppchog.org. Again, that's P-P-C-H. OG.org. Right there on the homepage, if you scroll down on your phone, tablet, computer, whatever kind of device, if it accesses the internet, you can get there. Scroll down and click on the sentence that says um, in green, Worship Guide August 9th, Sunday, August 9th. There you can find our worship guide and follow along in our order of service today. Also, for those of you that are actually looking at me with your own eyes without the aid of a screen right now, Uh, We do ask that you scan this QR code, or you can go to tinyurl.com slash parkplacehey on your phone or tablet, and um, there you will find a form. We do need to know, per all of our stipulations and everything, uh, that you are here. Uh, That's per CDC guidelines and everything. So we do need to know that you are physically here in this building. So please go there. If you need any help at all, just raise your hand after service and someone will be more than glad to help you out, uh, myself included. Just grab me. Don't grab me. Be six feet away. Uh, <laughs> uh, but just bring my attention uh, and I'd be, I or anybody else will be more than glad to help you out with that. Finally, again, per our other guidelines here, for those of you that are here in this building right now, uh, we do ask that you please exit the sanctuary from the back to the front. Uh, so there will be ushers after the, as the organ plays that will help you um, as, uh, exit the sanctuary from the back to the front. And then please use the uh, circle drive and the south exits from the building. So those two doors, that you, either one of those doors that you came in, please only exit through one of those two doors. Uh, we thank you for joining us in worship, and um, may we just enjoy each other's company, whether we're here in the building or you're tuning in from home.
need to take my mask off so that my phone recognizes my face and I can get my notes up. And Autumn and I are going to stay very far away from each other. <laughs> Keep our germs to ourselves. And I have a lot to, to hold right now. Well, good morning again. I'm Pastor Kirsten, and this morning I'm going to be interviewing Autumn Gale um, about something called Engaging Young Adults. Uh, for the past few years, our church has participated in a grant process through the Center for Congregations, yes, called Engaging Young Adults. And Autumn has served as our lead on this huge project. And uh, since that grant process is coming to an end, uh, she's here to tell us a little bit about it. So, Autumn, what is Engaging Young Adults? Well, as you've mentioned, it, it was a three-year program that we um, journeyed with the Center for Congregations. And the goal was to um, help mobilize Indiana churches to engage, better engage, 19 to 34-year-olds. Um, this is a challenge across the, um, the landscape for the American church. And um, we learned with them and also learned here and alongside our folks here, our young adults here, and implemented an 18-month grant. Awesome. And you'll see up on the screens, we have some highlights um, about some different projects that the EYA team put into place. And there's also a really cool poster from which these slides were taken out in the hallway on your way out if you'd like to look at it as well. Autumn, anything you want to say about highlights from projects? I'm springing this question on you yeah. literally right now. <laughs> so you can say pass if you'd like to. No, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions anyone would have about um, the grant and the process we've been, been through. Um, highlights. Um, there are several. So my mind is... is um, taking a moment here. The mentoring partnership rises to the top. Um, many of you have participated in that and intentionally engaged with an AU student for one semester. Um, this was a very informal um, experience, but one that I've heard has been mutually beneficial for um, students and mentors. And um, a special thank you to our mentors and students who braved that with us. Um, we averaged about 12 to 14 students each semester, and it was um, just a delightful experience that we plan to continue here at Park Place. Um, if you're interested in that, we will be starting again. So um, feel free to check out the website or um, connect with me, and I'd be happy to talk more with you about that. Um, we had a lot of learning opportunities along the way. We provided a social capital training. We um, did some financial literacy um, classes. We um, had an extraordinary field day last year. Um, this was not in our grant initially. We were able to make some adjustments. But that was another um, time together um, and really the focus of engaging young adults is about relational time together, connecting with one another. Um, and that was a, a special day we hope to continue in the future. Thanks. And who can we thank for being a part of this process with you? Yes. Um, this three-year journey would not have been possible without an extraordinary group of volunteers. Um, so uh, I think that... Um, with the dedication of this small group of volunteers and their intentionality, um, we, we saw some really awesome things happen here at Park Place. And I want to personally thank James Bell, Jen Carney, Andrew Gale, Michaela Hamill, Holly Miller, Courtney Rice Alford, Nick Don Stanton Rorick, Lydia Stanton Rorick, Pam Shute, Dave Simpson, Graham States, Pastor Kirsten Streit Harding, Don Brady Wimmer, and Pastor Karma Wood. Um, a special thank you to Pastor Karma and Kirsten in their diligent and painstaking efforts with communications and all that um, transpired with the welcome space and the signage on the building's website. There were so many details with that, and um, it's beautiful. So thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry. You're fine. Just want to say, well done, team. Um, I am so honored to have worked with you all, and thank you. Um, you are a part of a significant ministry here at Park Place that bubbled up some new life for us, and um, I'm so grateful. Thank you. 
Well, and Autumn, we want to thank you um, for your leadership and your passion and your attention to insane minute details <laughs> with this grant. We truly could not have done this without you, and you stood in a gap, and we are so grateful for you. Um, and I have something I'm going to give to you once we have our masks back on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but church, um, here in the building and at home, would you thank Autumn and our EYA team? Yes. Oh, she has another announcement. I'm so sorry. I do have gifts for our team members. For those of you who are here, um, I will be in the back North X afterwards. I would like to pass that on. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you, EYA team, for all that you have done uh, for us at this building. As we come into this time of prayer, I would like you to join me in a little activity. And that's everybody, whether you're here in this building or at home. Oftentimes, I like to, well, let me back up just a minute. If you know me at all, you know I'm a busybody. <laughs> I have a lot of energy, and sometimes I need to consciously remember to slow down. And this time has been crazy. These last five, six months has been absolutely nuts. In some ways, yes, I feel like I've had more time to kind of calm down, but in many other ways, I feel like I've been more busy than any other time in my life. And I need to just be. So for the next couple minutes, as we come into this time of prayer, I want you to just be. Close your eyes with me. And be okay with a stillness and a silence. For you young families at home, maybe, <laughs> maybe it's not silent right now. And that's okay. Whatever you're hearing right now, may it be worship. May it be your prayer. Slowly breathe in and out. And remember all of those in special need right now. As we pray for Bonnie Bailey and continued prayer for her. Ed Bowser as he's home from a fall. All those affected by the explosion in Beirut. And as we continue this time of prayer, you'll hear an old gospel song. The lyrics will be up on the screen, so if you'd like to open your eyes and follow along this, with the lyrics on the screen, you are more than welcome to do that. Otherwise, just continue to be. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down in the river to pray. As I went down in the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Come on, brothers, let's go down, down in the river to pray. Sorry, crown, good Lord. 
I asked Nuhad Melki, who attends Park Place and attends AU, if he would help me know how to pray for the people in Lebanon and specifically Beirut, where a massive explosion occurred this past week on Tuesday. The numbers Nuhad shared with me and that are mentioned in many news sources is that 147 have died, 4,000 were injured, and 300,000 are now homeless. Three hospitals were destroyed. Three Church of God churches were also destroyed. All of those congregants have been accounted for and are alive. Nuhad has many loved ones, family and friends living in Beirut. So let's take some time to pray for them and those others um, in our country, in our congregation. Please pray with me. God, I come to you today with as much openness as I feel that I can. I ask you to soften our hearts, my heart. Help to allow us to see the walls um, that we've built up to block you out and help us to tear down those bricks, the posts, the concrete that we put between you and ourselves. I pray along with and on behalf of those of us who aren't sure about our faith right now, who aren't sure about you, God, who you are, who wonder if you are really there. If, if you really care for us. I pray for those who question our faith our spirituality and our goodness and whether or not we're living out the lives you've created us to do. Come alongside us, before us, behind us, and help us remember your gentle leading and guiding. Help us remember what Jesus reminded us of in Matthew. Come to me, all you who are weary, and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Help us lean into you and rest while also renewing our strength as you promise so that we can be encouragers and courageous voices of your justice and your truth. Help us to listen well to people who are suffering. Help us to listen to black, indigenous, and people of color who have been forced to carry the historical and generational trauma and the current traumas of being brutalized, enslaved, forced to leave their homes and land, and then continuously discriminated against over hundreds of years in this nation. Help us listen to the adults and children who have been orphaned, people who have been widowed, people who have been imprisoned, whether they are guilty or not of a crime, people who are facing emotional, physical, spiritual, and sexual abuse and neglect, and people who feel abandoned and lonely. Help us to be gentle, loving, safe, supportive people, individually and collectively, who the, for those who deserve to be hear, heard. We pray now specifically for the people in and connected to Lebanon and Beirut. We pray for healing of Nuhad's distant cousin who has been injured. 
We pray for Nuhad's grandpa, whose store was destroyed, and with that, all of his grandpa and grandma's income and savings. God, give them strength to endure and peace. We pray for Nuhad's uncle, Amo Kamil, and his work leading Heart for Lebanon to relieve victims, churches, and schools. We are grateful with Nuhad that his family is alive. He expresses so much gratitude for that. We pray for the country as a whole. We ask your hand and guidance and the government systems and deep and long-term political unrest over corruption and in the famine and economic collapse that country is facing. Help each person there know they are loved and important as you continue to be present and loving to them. We pray for protection of the people who've taken to the streets and are being gassed, beaten, and shot at. Help us as a community and our wider nation and countries all over the world know how to help, support, love, and be near to Lebanon as they go through this time. We pray for Bonnie Bailey as she's at home recovering from surgery this week, and Ed Bowser as he faced a fall, but now is home recovering as well. I turn to this hymn, Just As I Am, and the newer chorus from it, as I close today. O Lamb of God, or just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. I come broken to be mended. I come wounded to be healed. I come desperate to be rescued. I come empty to be filled. I come guilty to be pardoned by the blood of Christ the Lamb. And I'm welcomed with open arms. Praise God, just, just as I am. 139 al director musical Salmo de David. Señor, tú me examinas, tú me conoces. Sabes cuando me siento y cuando me levanto. Aún a la distancia me leas el pensamiento. Mis trajines y descansos los conoces. Todos mis caminos te son familiares. No me llega aún la palabra a la lengua cuando tú, Señor, ya la sabes todo. Tu protección me envuelve por completo. Me cubres con la palma de tu mano. Conocimiento tan maravilloso rebasa mi comprensión. Tan sublime es que no puedo entenderlo. ¿A dónde podría alearme de tu espíritu? ¿A dónde podría huir de tu presencia? Si subiera al cielo, allí estás tú. Si tendiera mi lecho en el fondo del abismo, también estás allí. Si me elevara sobre las alas del Abba, o me estableciera en los extremos del mar, Aún ahí tu mano me guiaría, me sostendría tu mano derecha. Y si dijera, que me acotan las tinieblas, que la luz se haga noche en torno mío. Ni las tinieblas serían oscuras para ti, y aún la noche sería clara como el día. Lo mismo son para ti las tinieblas que la luz. Tú creaste mis entrañas. Me formaste en el vientre de mi madre. Te alabo porque soy una creación admirable. Tus obras son maravillosas y esto lo sé muy bien. Mis huesos no te fueran desconocidos cuando en las más recóndito ero yo formado. Cuando en lo más profundo de la tierra era yo entretejido. Tus ojos vieron mi cuerpo en gestación. Todo estaba ya escrito en tu libro. Todos mis días se estaban diseñando, aunque no existía uno solo de ellos. La palabra de Dios para el pueblo de Dios. Gracias a Dios. Amen. Well, good morning. I'm Pastor Jonathan Grubbs, and it is good to see you, whether you are here 
or watching on screen today as we continue in our study of Psalm 139. Now, James chapter 1, verse 22 reminds us to be doers of the word, not merely hearers that deceive themselves. You see, this morning I want to take a few minutes with you, and as we think and reflect on Psalm 139, I don't want us to simply hear it, but how can we begin to experience and do it? Today I want to take a few minutes with you and really focus on three verses, verse 8, 10, and 12. And I invite you, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me there in Psalm 139. And as we look today, to hear what the text says, but to experience and to live out this understanding that God is here, that God is leading us, going before us, and that in the midst of any darkness, God is our light. Not simply as words to be heard, but realities to experience. Because that's the point of this whole series of when God's story intersects with our story. You see, Psalm 139 is one of the most personal chapters and sections of the Scripture. It is this intimate encounter with the presence of God that changes and transforms our lives. So today, may we be doers of the Word, not simply hearers. Would you again pray with me? Gracious and loving God, thank you for these moments that we can come now to hear from you. But, oh God, today may we begin to experience anew and afresh the presence, Lord, that you live in and around us and through us, how you lead and direct and bring light and insight. So, Lord, Speak anew and afresh to us today. Give us ears to hear, lives that will respond to all that you are saying to us. And God, may the words now of my mouth, the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight and useful for your people, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And so I invite you today to enter into the story, God's story, and allow it to intersect and meet you and your story. That's what the text, the psalmist is speaking to. Look at verse 8. It says, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. See, the first lesson for us today, I believe, is to understand not only that God's presence is in our lives and working in and around us, but it also calls us to understand our being present in our own story in lives. You see, here's the point. God is there, but are we Have you even lately maybe been talking to someone, you went, "Ah, are you listening? (laughs) Or have you been the one where someone was talking to you and they said, are you paying attention to me right now? And you kind of had to fess up, oops, maybe not so much. I believe that's happening in some ways here in the text. In verse 7, the psalmist says, where can I go? Where can I flee from your presence? You see, the psalmist is not just proclaiming the reality that God is there, God is here. The psalmist is also acknowledging probably that there have been moments in their own life and experience they've tried to flee, to run, to go. But no matter what, God is there. But the point is, sometimes we aren't. (laughs) Can you relate to that? Sometimes we run, we go, we flee, and we're not quite really there. 
But I think the real problem might not be so much in our running or our going, but just the opposite. Oh, kind of maybe our sleeping. How many of us this morning, let's be honest, whether you're here or watching on TV, how many of us today hit the snooze button this morning? Uh-huh. How many of us in a week usually like hitting that snooze button? Anthony Reeder, a French alarm clock designer, patented the first snooze button in 1847. And ever since, we have made use of it, right? <laughs> Some of us love hitting that snooze button. But it's not just about our alarms. Sometimes it becomes the reality of our lives and our living. Some of us are kind of snoozing on life, our story. We even say things, oh, life's a blur, life's passing me by. You, you see, we get so distracted, disconnected, preoccupied, and I have to wonder, are we really present? You see, this psalm proclaims that God is there, but I want to ask you today, are you? Because sometimes we're not always present in our lives, in our stories. We aren't really there. I love telling this story. A number of years ago, it was in the early 90s, I had a group of teenagers that I had taken to Chicago. We did a ministry and mission in inner, the inner city of Chicago, and one evening, late at night, we had worked all day in the inner city and were walking back to where we were staying and walking along Rush Street. Maybe some of you have been there in Chicago. When one of my teenagers, a 16-year-old boy named Seth, said, Jonathan, that's Phil Collins. Now, I'm dating myself. Some of you don't maybe even know who Phil Collins is. But in the early 90s, he was a big thing. He had won eight Grammy Awards. Uh, he was the lead singer of a band named Genesis and then his own uh, solo act. He had been in movies and written famous songs in the air tonight, Against All Odds and Susudio. And I, I was at that time there on the street in Chicago going down Rush Street. I was tired. I was distracted. I just wanted to get back and go to bed. And Seth is going, Jonathan, that's Phil Collins. And I went, Seth, no, it's not. And Seth turned around, ran back a few steps. And I stood there, arms kind of crossed. And Seth talked to this guy for a few minutes. And then a few more minutes. And then a few more minutes. And finally, I decided I need to go rescue this guy. And so I walked up to Seth. And Seth goes, I was right. This is Phil Collins. And for more than 10 minutes, Phil Collins stood and talked to this 16-year-old teenager who I had dismissed because I was so distracted, disconnected, and preoccupied with what was going on that I missed what and who was right in front of me. The psalm proclaims, if I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. You see, the hope, the promise of this text that God is there. Our problem is sometimes we are not. See, our problem is sometimes we miss what is right in front of us. Who is right in front of us? We become so distracted, disconnected, and preoccupied with the busyness, the stress, the anxieties of life that we aren't really present in our own life and story. One of my favorite quotes from Thomas Merton says, you do not need to know precisely what is happening or exactly where it is all going. What you need is to recognize the possibilities and challenge offered by the present moment and embrace them with 
faith and hope. What gets in the way of you being present in your own life and story this morning? Is it things such as worry or regret, fear or uncertainty? How often these things become barriers to our truly being fully present and engaged in the life that is happening to us in our own story. We've hit the snooze. We're asleep, ignoring, pretending, absent from the God who is work and present all around us. Do you hear the words? Recognize the possibilities offered by the present moment because God is there. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there there. That's the gift, the gift of the present moment that God is here with us, among us, present. Oh, but our problem, our problem is that we are not really present. Our problem is this. For so many of us, we are spending too much time dwelling on our past or thinking about our future that we're not really present in the moment. We wonder why we're constantly restless, that we lack an interior peace and joy, but the answer is right before us, literally right in front of us. It's called the present moment. It is God's very presence in the moment. And one of the reasons we miss this great gift is because we fail to live, to acknowledge the present moment. We dwell on the past, not the good memories. Oh, no, it's the negative ones. We feel regret for past actions. We experience resentment, which literally means to feel again. And so we harbor anxiety and anger towards persons or a person. We dwell on the hurts, our failures, the regret, resentment, hurt, failure, all of that. Is that any way to spend our moments dwelling on the past? Or instead, we get consumed and caught up in thinking about the future. And the result of that is that we only experience the fear of the unknown or the what may be. And so we get all caught up and worry about events and how they might turn out. We conjure up scenarios that cause anxiety. We become consumed with fear and worry, anxiety. Is that any way to spend our moments Oh, no wonder people who dwell in the past or live in the future fail to experience the presence of God in the present moment, the peace and joy that God brings in being here. The past is gone, friends. The future is not here. It is simply irrational to spend our mental and emotional energies that bring only inner turmoil, dwelling in the past, living in the future, is missing out on the gift. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go into the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Don't miss it. God's presence. Do you hear the words? You are there. Are we? Are we snoozing and absent from the present moment, even in our own lives and stories? See, the text is calling us to experience and to live in the present moment of God's presence who is here. But that's not the only lesson. Verse 8 then leads into verse 10. 
this call not only to be present in our own story, but listen, secondly then, to be present in God's story. Verses 9 and 10, if I take the wings of the morning and settle at the furthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall lead me. The psalmist reminds us of the the benefits of this understanding, this acknowledgement, this living in the moment and the presence of God that leads to this sense of peace and trust and that it brings. Because only in that kind of experience and existence do we become acutely aware of God's presence and how God is acting in our lives. Your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall shall lead me. What is that idea, the right hand of God? How does that exactly impact our life? Throughout Scripture, the image, the metaphor of God's right hand has to do with a picture reflecting for us the very pinnacle of God's strength and protection. Listen to just these Psalms, Psalms 44, 3. For by their own sword they did not possess the land, and their own arm they did not save themselves. But by your right hand, your arm, and the light of your presence, for you favored them. Psalm 17, 7, wondrously show us your loving kindness, O Savior of those who take refuge at your right hand, from those who would rise up against us. Psalm 18, 35, you have given me the shield of your salvation, and your right hand upholds me. Your gentleness makes me great. Then lastly, Psalm 20, and these are just a few. Psalm 20, verses 6 and 7, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some boast in chariots, some in horses, but we, we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. What are these psalms speaking to? Listen, it is this idea, this comparison, a contrast of living in our own strength out of our own energies and abilities that fail or instead living in the reality, the strength and provision of God's right hand. You see, we have a choice. Do we live by our own hand, our own efforts, our own ingenuities, our own actions? Or do we live our day-to-day lives knowing that God's hand is leading us? Will we today, will we right now surrender and give ourselves over and allow God to lead us? It is only when we do that, only when we choose that surrender, that obedience, giving ourselves over to God that we experience this peace, this trust, the strength, and the protection. If I take wings of the morning and settle at the furthest limits of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand shall lead me. Today, can we begin to experience, to really truly live in the present moment and experience God's presence? Because when we do so, God begins to work in our lives, to lead and guide us. And then lastly, here is why. It is the third lesson to be present in our own stories, to be present in God's story, because it is a story of light, light in our darkness. Verse 12, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day. Listen to this, for darkness is as light to you. Darkness is as light to you. You see, God wants to break through the darkness of our lives and reveal the light of God's presence, the light 
of the presence of Christ. Phillips Brooks, uh, an Episcopal priest, known probably best for his Christmas carol, O Little Town of Bethlehem, says this. Listen to this quote. The greatest danger facing all of us is not that we will make an absolute failure of life. No, the danger is that we will fail to perceive life's greatest meaning, fall short of its highest good, miss its deepest and most abiding happiness, be able, unable to tender the most needed service, and listen, to be unconscious of a life ablaze with the light of the presence of God. Oh, to be unconscious of the uh, unblazing life that is provided by the presence of God. That's what this psalm is calling us, inviting us to, that our, our lives would be ablaze with that light. For darkness is as light to you. See, what I love about this psalm is it speaks to the reality of our struggling in the dark, left to ourselves. We are in the dark. As a kid growing up, one of my favorite places to go was McCormick's Creek State Park down in Spencer, Indiana. If you go to McCormick's Creek State Park, there's a, a, a cave there called Wolf Cave. Fortunately, I don't think you can go through it anymore, but as a, ki a kid, years ago, you, you could. It's a little bit more than 50 yards or so, and one of the things I would love to do is to turn off the flashlight at the beginning of the cave and then make my way as it wound through the, the darkness. And invariably, as I would kind of wa uh, wind through the cave and use my hands to try to figure it out, I'd hit something and knock my head, scratch my knee, fall down, but finally kind of wind out until I could finally see the light at the end of the cave. That has been an important metaphor in my life because I have found my life now as an adult, often now, still kind of trying to feel my way through life, groping through the darkness, hitting my head, scratching myself up, wondering how much further, which, where, and where things will turn out. You see, this psalm speaks to the reality of our struggle in darkness. And friends, there are some of us here this morning and at home that are doing more than just simply bumping our heads, scratching our knees, and stumbling. We are experiencing hurt and pain and struggle on a deep emotional level. We are struggling and wandering in the dark. But the psalm doesn't just speak to the reality of that darkness. It then speaks to a different way. For darkness is as light to you. You see, it points us to a different way because life is full of choices. And we can choose not to just stumble through the darkness, but to look to the light. 1 John 1.17 says, but if we are living in the light of God's presence just as Christ is, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus' His Son cleanses us from every sin. You see, the Bible tells us that we have a choice in how we live. We have a choice in terms of how we see life. Will we live it according to the light even in our darkness, that is what the presence of Christ, the Holy Spirit, is all about. One of my favorite writers and theologians, Thomas Oden, says, our modern tendency is to depersonalize the Spirit, to treat God the Spirit as reducible to an idea of spirituality or some attribute of God, rather than God's own personal indwelling in the moments of our life and in throughout human history. And this has contributed to the neglect and the misunderstanding of God. You see, this psalm points to a different way. For the darkness is as light to you. 
Because the psalm is an invitation to the light. It is this recognizing, oh Lord, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. It is this invitation to experience the indwelling presence of Christ, not as some idea of spirituality, some attribute of God, some philosophy, even a religion, but a personal experience and encounter with the indwelling presence of Jesus. John 12, 46, I have come as light to shine in this dark world so that all who will put their trust in me will no longer remain in darkness. An invitation to live in the hope, courage, direction, love, and power of the indwelling presence and spirit of Jesus. For darkness is as light to you, not as some idea, not as some abstract philosophy, not even as as some practice of simply showing up in church or watching something on your television screen, but a reality in your heart and life. Is it any wonder that John would begin his gospel with those wonderful words that say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. It could be easy to hear these words from the psalm today and just take them as words. But my hope and prayer is that each and every one of us today would not just take them as words, but a call to experience be present in our own stories and lives. Be present in God's story, allowing God to lead us by His own hand. And an invitation to return, to come back to, and to allow God to be the light in our darkness. To return to the presence of Jesus to allow His Spirit to move in our own hearts and lives. Because that, that is truly when God's story intersects our story. That is when truly God's story meets our story. And so I invite you today to take a few moments of prayer and reflection. How is it today maybe that you just need to maybe stop hitting that snooze on your life and to show up and be more present in your own life and story? Where is it? Where is it in your own life that you need to surrender, to give God control, to allow Him to lead you by His right hand and to come? in the darkness of your own life, and let the presence and Spirit of Jesus be light, light in your darkness. One of the ways that you can reflect and spend a few more moments, uh, you heard Pastor Josh at the beginning of our service mention the worship guides. You can find this on our website. At the end of our worship guides, we have that little section that says, Digging Deeper. And I want to invite you today or this week, go back and reread Psalms 139, 7 through 12. Answer some of those questions there. And allow yourself to find yourself at the intersection of God's story meeting yours. 
Gracious and loving God today, I would pray in the close of this service that, oh God, we would not simply be hearers, but doers. Help us, O oh God, to be like the psalmist, to recognize that you are there, that you are leading by your right hand, and that, O oh God, to you, even the darkness is as light. Come and be our light today. Move in our hearts, our lives. Today, may we just open ourselves anew and afresh to allow your story to intersect and meet our story. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you tuned in or glad that you joined us. We want to encourage you, especially in these difficult times, to remain uh, uh, committed to the things that we are doing here at church and out in our community. We know these are hard, difficult times, but things like wearing masks and social distancing, staying home when you need to, being careful is what keeps us well and healthy, and we are committed to that. So commit yourselves as well. We want to remind you as we wrap up our services today that again we'll dismiss from the back towards the front. The ushers will come and dismiss you. But today may you go in the strength and the power of God's presence, allowing his story to show up in your story. Hear these words as we go today. And so now as you go into the world or stay in your homes, Know that God is there, that God will lead you by God's hand, and that God is light in our darkness. Hear these words. Know that God will go before and lead you, that God will go behind and protect you, that God will go beneath and support you, that God will go beside and befriend you. Do not be afraid. And so now, may the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and go with you. Go in the peace and the love of the light of the world. Go in peace. <laughs>